Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the National Recovery Month kickoff. I'm excited to be here today to officially begin the 2018 National Recovery Kickoff event live in our nation's capital. This is an important time for all who treasure recovery and the value it holds in our lives and in our communities. The National Recovery Month kickoff event is being live streamed in the, through the HHS website, and I would like to welcome all who have joined us virtually. At this time, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing you to the Director of Substance, Substance, uh, Sub, substance Abuse Treatment, uh, Dr. Chideha Oheaha. Uh, Dr. O Ohuaha, uh, as he likes to be called, Dr. O, has joined SAMHSA in June 2018. Before that, joining the SAMHSA team, he served as the Deputy Director for Addictive Medicine at Fort Belvoir, Virginia for seven years. He was responsible for implementing the co-occurring partial hospitalization program. He was also chief psychiatrist for the Wounded Warrior Transition Brigade, as well as the medical director for the, assistant, the assertive community uh, treatment team at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, DC. So please, let's give Dr. Ohuaha a round of applause. Good morning, and welcome again to the kickoff of this year's National Recovery Month. Uh, SAMHSA is proud to have sponsored this very important event, now in its 29th year. And I'm honored to be taking part in my first Recovery Month as a director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. This year's team joined Voices for, for Recovery, Invest in Health, Home, Purpose, and Community highlights the importance of integrated care, a strong community, sense of purpose, and leadership to achieving effective treatment that sustains recovery. As you know, we're in the midst of a public health emergency focused on the nation's ongoing opioid crisis. Recovery Month reminds us that despite the many challenges we face in tackling the nation's behavioral health issues, we also have successes. I want to recognize both those who are currently in recovery, as well as those who are providing valuable treatment and recovery services for those seeking their path to recovery. I encourage you all to participate in the Recovery Month activities in your areas by joining other forces, and let's show the nation that as dark as, dark as things may seem, as hopeless as someone might feel, recovery is possible, in fact, it's happening every day. Now it's my great pleasure to begin today's activity by introducing Dr. Eleanor McCann's Katz. Dr. McCann's Katz was recently appointed as the first Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use in the Department of Health and Human Services. In this role, she advises the HHS Secretary on improving behavioral health care in America and leads the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. She's a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry with more than 25 years as a clinician, teacher, and clinical researcher. She has served as the Chief Medical Officer for Behavioral Health Care in Rhode Island, as the State Medical Director for Alcohol and Drug Programs in California, and was a Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and at Brown University in Rhode Island. Dr. McCann's cast has published extensively in the areas of clinical pharmacology, medications development for substance use disorders, drug-drug interactions, addiction psychiatry, and treatment of HIV infection for persons who use drugs. She served on the World Health Organization Committee that developed guidelines on the treatment of persons who use drugs living with HIV AIDS and has been a national leader in addressing the overprescribing of opioids and analgesics and in providing consultation on management of patients with chronic pain and opioid misuse. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Katz leading SAMHSA during this critical time when we face the challenges of the opioid crisis and emerging needs 
of behavioral health, Dr. McCann's cats. So good morning. Um, before I go to my um, prepared remarks, I just want to uh, uh, mention uh, why we're doing things a little differently than we have done them in previous years at SAMHSA. So you may, um, you may uh, recall that um, SAMHSA has had a, a, a tradition, uh, at least in recent years, of doing a, a rollout of the national survey on drug use and health in combination with the celebration of the start of recovery month. Um, this previously has been um, held outside of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so in, in thinking about this and um, being involved in it last year, it gave me an opportunity to really look at, at, um, at how SAMHSA was, was doing this. And it's, it's my opinion that Recovery Month and the, the initiation uh, activities for Recovery Month on the part of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is so important that it needs to have its own day. Uh, not to be part of the rollout of data, which is very important, and by the way, I hope all of you will tune in next Friday when I will do the presentation of the data from 2017 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, but today, Today, we celebrate recovery, and we need to devote all of our attention to that. So I'm very pleased to be with uh, you today to launch the National Recovery Month, and one of my primary goals in accepting the position of Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use was to ensure that SAMHSA does all it can to bring evidence-based practices to address mental and substance use disorders into communities across America. Thank you for joining us today on this occasion to recognize the importance of recovery and all of the benefits it brings to individuals, families, and communities. We know that for many living with substance use disorders and mental illness, the provision of evidence-based treatment combined with community supports makes recovery possible. The need for evidence-based treatment and services has perhaps never been more urgent in our country. That is why we believe in the importance of highlighting September as Recovery Month. There are many pathways to recovery. Often the pathway to recovery requires support from a variety of sources, including the help of healthcare practitioners, treatment providers, researchers, peers and peer service providers, and community supports. I believe that one of the most important aspects of Recovery Month is the opportunity to speak to the need throughout our nation to make evidence-based services available to Americans living with these conditions. Data tell us we need to do more to make treatment accessible to those living with substance use and mental disorders. Last year, analysis from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or NISDA as we call it, indicated that over half of the people who needed treatment for mental illness did not receive it. Data for those with substance use disorders indicated an even larger problem with approximately 90% not receiving the treatment they needed. Soon, SAMHSA will release data from the most recent NISDA for 2017, which unfortunately you will see also reveals large gaps in treatment need. The data also tell us that we must not view these conditions in isolation. The issue of co-occurring mental and substance use disorders is one we must address and we must pay very close attention to. A trained and well-equipped workforce is essential to assist individuals living with mental and substance use disorders. High quality, effective services should be afforded to everyone who needs them. For that reason, I have implemented a national network of regional technical assistance and training centers to address the needs of those living with substance use and mental disorders. Through ongoing support by SAMHSA of these training programs to local providers, including specialty and primary care staff, we will increase access to evidence-based treatment in a wider array of healthcare settings for those in need. The training of the workforce to address the opioid epidemic our nation currently faces is also a critical aspect of the achievement of recovery for so many. 
SAMHSA has vigorously supported efforts to promote the use of evidence-based medication-assisted treatment in combination with psychosocial services and community recovery supports. These resources are the gold standard for treating opioid use disorder. Through utilization of local expert teams, clinicians, preventionists, and recovery specialists, SAMHSA is promoting the use of evidence-based services for those living with opioid use disorders across the country. It will take all our concerted efforts, government at all levels, healthcare providers, treatment, families, peers, nonprofit groups, faith-based groups, and others to ensure evidence-based treatment and recovery support service are accessible and available for every person in need. Lives depend on it. As we come together today to celebrate National Recovery Month, it is also important to remember that for many with very serious mental health conditions, recovery has not been possible. We must work our hardest on behalf of these individuals and their families. We must give everyone the opportunity to receive proper care and treatment that they need, and we must actively work to help them to get that care. We must do all we can to ensure that the healthcare system treats all persons living with severe mental disorders with respect and provides them appropriate treatment, including medications and psychosocial services that they may need. It is for that reason SAMHSA has launched the Clinical Support System for Serious Mental Illness. This effort will train providers on the best strategies to treat serious mental illness, including those with the most acute severe illnesses and those who have not responded to standard psychiatric medical treatments. This program will also address the ongoing needs of those living with serious mental illness by providing training and technical assistance to providers, healthcare organizations, and local support groups to better assure that community-based services are available to address the goal of having all with these conditions be able to live the most productive and satisfying lives possible. I'm committed to doing all I can to provide all individuals with mental and substance use disorders the care and services they need. I'm inspired by your stories of recovery, and I appreciate your willingness to share them with us today. In recognition of those who forge their recovery path, and for those who may be searching for their own pathway, Dr. Arthur Kleinschmidt will be leading us through a meaningful dialogue with our panel of providers and persons with lived recovery experience. I'm grateful for everyone's participation today, and thank you for your continued support of Recovery Month. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Dr. McCants Katz and Dr. Ahuaha for sharing words of inspiration and hope that we can carry with us as we begin to share the possibilities of recovery this month and throughout the year. And I really want to thank Dr. McCants Katz for being our leader. She's doing an awesome job, and I'm very proud that she leads our organization. Uh, each year, the National Recovery Month campaign produces two 30-second public service announcements. Both are available in English and Spanish. They embody the year's theme and focus. The 2018 PSAs and many more like them have been produced over the years and are available on the recoverymonth.gov website. The title of the first PSA is R is for Recovery. The title of the second PSA is Voices for Recovery. So please turn your attention to the videos and enjoy. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is real. You can recover. It's possible. It happens every day. Never give up on yourself. Discover hope and help. I thought I was too far gone. I wasn't. Join the voices for recovery. The world is a beautiful place again. 
for 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral for mental and substance use disorders for you or someone you know. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Voices for recovery. Recovery from mental and substance. What if being in recovery from a mental or substance use disorder was something we proudly showed the world? You might be surprised. Millions of people are in recovery, sharing hope, help, and support with family, friends, and community. Join the Voices for Recovery. For 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral for mental and substance use disorders for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Yeah. yeah, those are great videos. I also like that R can be used for relationships and resiliency, which are both uh, aspects of recovery. So right now we have a special panel of presenters who will talk about two of SAMHSA's newest grant programs that engage individuals with mental and substance use disorders. So I'd like to invite everybody up to the stage. To my immediate left, we have Abigail Moore, the CEO of the San Antonio Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness Program, which is a grantee of the Buildings Community, Building Communities of Recovery grantee. This grant program was established by the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, or the CARA Bill. The purpose of this program is to mobilize resources within and outside of the recovery community to increase the prevalence and quality of long-term recovery support. These grants are intended to support the development, enhancement, expansion, and delivery of recovery support services. Next to Abigail is Vicki Thomas. Uh, next to her is Katie Reinheimer. And we got a very courageous individual, Brody. So, uh, so Abigail, let's start with you. Would you be willing to share some about your program and the great work you all are doing? Absolutely. First of all, we'd like to thank SAMHSA for the invitation. My name is Abigail Moore, and I am the CEO of the San Antonio Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness in San Antonio, Texas. And due to, uh, thanks to the funding of the CARA grant through the BCOR, uh, Building Communities of Recovery, um, our project, Project Recovery Texas, uh, we are in our second year. And we are able to work with our city and our county on removing the stigma that comes with substance use disorders and helping our community understand that it is a disease and that recovery is possible and that recovery is long term and that there are many pathways to recovery. So we've really partnered with um, law enforcement, criminal justice systems, uh, our, of course, our city, our county, uh, our 13 college and universities. Also, um, the schools and the military bases there in San Antonio, Texas, right. to address the, um, the substance use disorder stigma, to um, help educate our community and give our community hope, because our community needs hope. Um, this disease uh, impacts not only the individual struggling with the disease, but also the entire family. We had 1,800 overdose reversals in 2017. Um, due to opioids and uh, we do have a problem but we are coming together as a city and a state to address uh, substance use disorders and to provide resources to our community and help our community uh, embrace recovery and celebrate recovery as well we're getting ready to host our very first recovery parade uh, on the riverwalk so we encourage everyone to come and join us there on the riverwalk um, Again, bringing the whole community, the faith-based, uh, the other support, uh, self-help groups, and just helping uh, our community understand that there are many pathways to recovery. And this funding, again, helps us remove the stigma and promote hope for our community. Uh, thank you so much, Abigail. I really appreciate the uh, work that y'all are doing. Uh, next to Abigail is Vicki Thomas. She's a person in long-term recovery and a peer specialist. Vicki, would you like to share with us some of your recovery experiences, your strength, your hope with the group? 
Sure. My name is Vicki Thomas, and like Art said, I am a person in long-term recovery. I have been in recovery for eight and a half years from an opiate and benzodiazepine use disorder. And earlier in my life and in my first career, um, I was a nurse and nursed for, I was a nurse for 14 years in RN in the state of Texas. And the last two years of um, my nursing career, I went into and did consulting work. And I found that consulting work was very isolating and it was very high paced, it was extremely stressful and it led me to some risky behaviors that I think led me to having an opiate and benzodiazepine use disorder. In my consulting career, I traveled every week, and as I said, it was very isolating. During that time period, my mental health issues were also declining, but I wasn't ready to admit that I had a problem. I struggled with addiction or with um, depression during that time, and it just escalated until things got so bad that I did reach for medication to help me feel better. After that, I um, had a back injury and fell on some ice when I was living in Boston, and I was introduced for the very first time the combination of opiates and benzodiazepines. And within a few days, I remember thinking, I just want more. Mm -hmm. Things were very dark in my life at that time. And it was easier, maybe not easier. Um, it felt better when I had medication. And my addiction progressed very quickly from there. And I spent six years um, trying to show to the outside world that everything was OK when on the inside, nothing was okay. And I used medication um, to just mask so many other issues that I wasn't ready and able um, to deal with. So as any good nurse, I was a student of pharmacology. So I was very good at mixing and matching what medications I was going to take and when. And, um, I remember in the last days of my addiction, I was on such a schedule of when I needed to take medication and when I just needed more that I was unable to work, I was unable to participate in family events, I was unable to have meaningful relationships. Um, once the doctors that I was um, using to get medications caught on to me, I, I got fired from several practices and started buying drugs off the street because I still needed things to help me feel a little more normal, a little better. Once I was having trouble um, buying off the streets, I decided that I was going to be my own doctor and I called in a pain medication prescription to the pharmacy. At that point, I still didn't think I had a problem. I spent six years thinking I didn't have a problem. My only problem was that I had a back injury and chronic pain. So I went to the pharmacy to pick up a medication that I fraudulently called in and was arrested at the pharmacy. It wasn't until then that I realized that I might have a problem. I was very lucky and extremely blessed to have a family that was willing to help me get help and they were willing to pay for me to go to treatment. They were, they were willing and they were able to pay for me to not work for a period of time after um, I was in treatment. One of the beautiful things of my story in going to treatment was that I was introduced to the, uh, the text of um, Alcoholics Anonymous Big Book. And in treatment, I also met my first sponsor. I saw the beauty and all the wonderful things that were going on in her life and I wanted what she had and I was willing to do anything to get it. So that started my recovery journey and as I said, that was eight and a half years ago and um, I truly believe that my faith, um, my spiritual journey and most importantly, my family got me to where I am today. After I was in recovery, I decided not to go back to nursing. I really didn't feel like I wanted to be a nurse anymore. And there were a lot of different reasons for that. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what my next career was going to be. 
So I went to work for a coffee shop and was a barista. And let me tell you how hard the conversation was when I was on the interview because on my resume, you know, the person I'm interviewing with is seeing that I worked as an RN in the state of Texas for almost 15 years. How do you explain that you're going, making a huge transition from one job um, in a um, professional career to a job as a barista? And I think that was when I, was searching for jobs, that's when I first experienced the stigma associated with substance use disorders. And I had a really hard time even wanting to explain what had happened, but I was forced to explain in interview after interview just because of the sh dramatic shift in my professions. So I was a, a barista, very active in the recovery community, and still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to work somewhere in recovery. So I've spent several years just working, working in my recovery, working to rebuild relationships, then moved to San Antonio approximately two years ago. I took my first job at a treatment center um, there in San Antonio, and when I worked there, I started hearing wonderful things about the San Antonio Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness. And I would periodically go to the website and look to see if they had any job postings. I didn't know about recovery coaches at the time, um, but one day, all of a sudden, there was a job posting that I was qualified for. So I um, applied and got the job, and now I'm working as a recovery coach. I do work on the Building Communities of Recovery grant. So we provide peer-to-peer -peer services for people with substance use disorders. So I work every day with a group of ladies um, to help remove barriers and to help the, remove the stigma of, substance, of um, people with substance use disorders. So we provide resources for people. We make a lot of referrals in our um, community to help with housing, transportation, food, um, clothing, employment, identification recovery. And those are the things that we do day to day. Another huge component of um, the grant that I work on is training. So myself and another gentleman, we go out into different um, offices and into different agencies, and we teach people about substance use disorders. We talk about stigma, and we talk about how important it is to change the language and the way we talk about substance use disorders. In all of the trainings that we've done, and we've, we've done 14 so far, in all of the trainings that we've done, over and over, we have heard that the most important part of our training are our personal stories. Yes, it's great to educate people about substance use disorders. It's great to talk about how um, far we've come in treatment, but how much more we need to do. But the personal stories are what seem to resonate with people and make the biggest impact. So I'm so honored to be here today. And there's one great phrase that a colleague of mine says almost every day, and it um, might be my most favorite sentence, that we are not bad people trying to get good. We are sick people trying to get better. And I think that really resonates with people, and it certainly has with me. So thank you so much for listening today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. We actually have very similar stories. I had a coffee shop job I got fired at over in early recovery. So I actually sort of know a lot of what you've been through and I really commend uh, your ability and your wherewithal to walk through the stigma and to st come up on stage and share your experiences with everybody. So uh, next I'd like to introduce Katie Reinheimer. Katie is the uh, supervisor from John Hopkins Rise Program, which is a grantee of SAMHSA's first episode psychosis program. The early psychosis intervention clinic was developed after the research under SAMHSA's recovery after initial schizophrenia episode. This grant program provides intensive, structured, team-oriented, long-term interventions to young adults and their families. Katie, would you be willing to share with us the great work that y'all are doing? Absolutely, thank you so much, and, and thanks SAMHSA for having us. Um, it's a real sort of pleasure to be sitting up here with such amazing um, folks talking about recovery. Um, so 
We received funds in January of 2015 from SAMHSA, and by May, we were up and running, um, following a very specific model called coordinated specialty care. And that model um, is a working, moving towards being an evidence-based practice if it's not already. We um, were trained by individuals from the University of Maryland's original RAISE study um, to help each of the individual components on the team be uh, sort of the best that we can be. Um, so the team is a multidisciplinary team. We have um, a primary therapist, which is my role. We have a recovery coach. That person, a little bit different than the substance abuse recovery coach, that person focuses on behavioral interventions tailored to the person. Uh, we have a peer support specialist, very cool, relatively new role on the team, and it's made a huge difference. We have two supported employment and education specialists. Uh, that model is also evidence-based. And we um, offer a multifamily psychoeducation group, another evidence-based practice. So um, we are able to do all of these things because of the funds we've received from SAMHSA. Um, the intensity that we're able to work with people is um, something that equivalent traditional outpatient programs really cannot offer. Uh, so we feel very blessed to be able to do um, all of the different things that we do. Thank you, Katie. Uh, now we have Brody, who's a very courageous uh, individual, who's going to share his experiences of what he's been through in his life. So Brody. Would... My name is Brody. I've struggled with schizophrenia for a couple years now. This program helped me a lot with making friends, medicine, and all that good stuff. Um... Tell us other symptoms a little bit. Oh, yeah. I remember having symptoms when I was, what, two years old, and they have calmed down now, but like when I got diagnosed when I was 15, I saw and heard some crazy stuff. I always have this hallucination where I see the girl from the ring and I hear the girl from the grudge. And that's like haunted me, but it's medicine among clozapine, best thing in the world. I'm glad they gave it to me. I tried multiple medicines, nothing worked. I went on high doses and all that stuff. coping skills have worked for you? What's helped you? Oh, yeah. The coping skills that really helped me was drawing, music, and video games because the game get stuff off my head. If I'm stressed out, yeah. You need, was your family able to help you through all oh, this? Oh, yeah. They helped me through a lot. If it wasn't for my mom and dad and family, honestly, I'd probably be dead by now. We, um, we were able to really utilize the full model with, um, with Brody. He was one of our first patients. Um, we have the flexibility to go out into the community to see folks and to spend uh, maybe two or three hours with someone if we need to, as opposed to the traditional 45 minute session. As a result of that, we were really able to work with Brody on you know, getting out of the house even during those times when it was very difficult, getting out of bed sometimes, um, <laughs> and you know, things like that. Is there anything you would like to share with say a, a younger person that's just starting to go through some of what you're going through or went if, through? If you're struggling, don't be afraid to ask, and if they say you have a diagnosis, don't be afraid to say what it is. Like, you know, like I have schizophrenia. I, at first, I was afraid to like the label schizophrenia, but then I had to go in and accept it. So what is your life like now that you're able to sort of confront and go through all the experiences that you went through? My, my life right now is probably the best. Finally graduated high school. Took me a couple years. <laughs> I got my anxiety under control, well, except for this right now, but <laughs> got that. I barely have any symptoms, and they taught me at Bayview, if you see stuff, confront it, like face it. So every time I see that girl, I go up to it and say, get away. Okay. Yeah. And then um, next, I'm going to get my permit, hopefully. So, yeah. So look out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but, but like what I see here today is all about resiliency uh, and getting back up after somebody falls. And I really appreciate the courage of you two to be here and share your experiences with the world. It really has a, goes a long way with recovery to actually see somebody walk the walk and exemplify sort of what is meant. So the, 
the uh, courageousness and the, you know, and the bravery that y'all show here today, I think, will go a long way. And also the amazing work you're doing, because I saw the interaction between Brody and Katie uh, backstage, and it's really um, an awesome thing to see. So I really appreciate the work you all are doing. I would like to thank you all for being part of this year's kickoff event. As we close this year's Recovery Month kickoff, we are energized to share recovery through our respective organizations and communities. Let's, let's remember to share this year's national recovery theme. Join the voices for recovery, invest in health, home, purpose, and community in our emails, web pages, and social media outlets, and let us continue to carry this message in our hearts so that we can remind everyone that investment in recovery is investment in mankind. Don't forget to plan your unique recovery event to your colleagues and go to the recoverymonth.gov website to see how the toolkit can help organizers plan a successful event. Um, many of you have come from near and far to be a part of the planning partners meeting. So thank you for that. Uh, some of you have been planning partners for years and have supported the National Recovery Month effort for as long as it has been in existence. So thank you. Some of you are joining us for the very first time. And again, thank you. Our collective efforts have always been our greatest assets. Even in like AA, they have the we part of the program. And Dr. McCants Katz talked about supportive relationships. Recovery is Relationships are central to recovery. So let us continue this work as we strive to make individuals and their families stronger across this nation. Travel home safely and I look forward to seeing you in January 2019. So thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.